What is up guys, Proto Bro here, Infamous Brother to Mega Bro, and third installment of the tutorial of Hearts of Iron 3 Black Ice. Today what I'm going to show you is the Diplomacy tab and how that functions, the Technology tab and the Politics tab, and a little bit of the Intel. Uh, I'm hoping to, I'm, I'm trying to keep these videos uh, short, but like I said at the very beginning, it's a very complicated game, there's a lot to it, and so I'm trying to cover everything to hopefully make your ease into the game uh, a lot easier. So, Diplomacy tab. Here's your overview for the Diplomacy. On the left here you have every single country that's currently uh, in Hearts of Iron 3. Um, usually this stays pretty consistent because even that countries that... Uh, most countries don't get annexed, they usually get puppeted. But anyway, so you have all these countries here. And then uh, the country that you have selected is right here. So currently it's us, obviously. And if you want to see kind of where we stand on this little triad of the various uh, you know political ideologies you would hit selected and we're down here so it looks like it, and the nice thing is when you hover over the particular country that you're interested in it'll give you a lot of details like for example here is drifting towards the common turn so in other words we're going left currently and if we want to go down here or up here there are a couple different things you can do to, to, to kind of influence that which I'll show you in a second uh, but if you click all that'll show you all the countries and then if you click like major these are the major countries so you got the common turn run by the Russians, you've got down here the Italians and the, the Germans, us, and, and so forth. Uh, neighbors, again, these are the countries that you directly neighbor. So here's uh, Republic of China. They're drifting towards Axis, but that'll that'll probably change. We'll start going more towards the, Demo uh, the democratic sphere of in influence. Um, so the reason this is important to know where each country is is that depending on where they're at on the uh, the political spectrum will influence the favorable trade agreements that you have with them, the likelihood that they'll ally up with a, you know, an enemy nation, um, the likelihood that they'll engage in non-aggression packs and so on and so forth. Uh, typically it's going to be really difficult, for example, for like a, uh, especially at times of war, for an Axis country or for like the Japanese here to you know, get like a, a lend lease or a production license with a Democrat country because they just don't trust them. Um, and those two terms that I just mentioned, the, the lend lease, the production license, I'll, I'll explain in a second. Over here you have with the, the countries basically what their surplus and what their um, low in. So for example, if we were to go to Mother Russia, so let's go here. All right, so the Russians uh, are lacking in supplies. They have a deficit of 754 a day, which, by the way, like when this game just starts, it takes about a week and then adjusts. Uh, but if this were, for example, uh, current terms, if they were short on 754 supplies, short on fuel, and short on money, then uh, as far as the money's concerned, right, they're not going to be willing to buy stuff from you. But they may be willing to give you uh, rare uh, minerals, for example. So I know uh, Japan, they, they tip their low, or they have a deficit in rare minerals. So you might actually go to, to Soviet, the Soviet Union, who currently our relations are zero, and we go to offer trade agreement, and we would ask to buy rare minerals. Notice down here when it says very likely, usually it says impossible or very likely. If it says impossible, even if you click accept, they're definitely not going to uh, agree to the, the trade agreement. Very likely means they almost always will agree to the trade agreement. And then right here, see how we get three rare minerals uh, per day for four money? The higher our relations are with that country and the closer the closer that we are aligned to their political influence, the better these trades actually turn out to be. So right now that's actually a pretty bad exchange. And you would notice if you were to compare, like say if you, you were the US and you were to do this with Japan versus England, you'd probably see that England provides you a better value for the rare minerals than, than say Japan. Uh, and then if you were to click accept, that would create a, uh, I'll show you in the menu in a second here. Let's do this. All right, so they accepted it. So if you went to your production tab, here is where that trade would be. So we are exporting money. We're exporting four money a turn, for or a day for three minerals. Right? If this was a, uh, if this was, for example, a a trade with, say, the Brits. Then probably what would also happen is you'd have to create a convoy down here, which would auto-populate if you have it uh, set up to do auto. And they would set up a convoy doing that trade. That's important to note because when you're at times of war, um, that's a supply route that you will have to protect. 
And so a lot of times what I'll do is just before I go to war with say the US or England or whatever, I'll cancel all those trade routes that I'm using by sea um, because you're, you're quite frankly going to lose them. You can't, can't protect them. So back to the diplomacy tab. Uh, so over here are all the different options that you have with that particular country. Um, let's see the US. So notice that our current relations are 75. The higher the current relation is, the less likely that country is to war, war deck you. Um, so obviously one of my strategies going in the game will be to keep to get the US as high uh, as possible with their current relations, try and get it up to, to 200. Um, and then one of the ways that I would do that is to do lots of trade agreements. So every time you engage in a trade agreement with that country, the higher your relations go. So you try and get your trade trade agreements, you try and get as many trade agreements with that country as possible. And then also there's things you can do to keep their neutrality as high as possible. Democrat countries cannot declare war until their neutrality gets below a certain point. Uh, so one of the things that you want to try and do with like with the US for example is trying to keep their neutrality as high as possible. Uh, that's more kind of your actions that influence their neutrality. Uh, so for example if you were to annex China that would drastically reduce their neutrality and also increase the threat that they are towards you. So one of the things you try and do as for example playing as Japan is to try and keep their neutrality as high as possible by not doing things that would um, I guess give the give the USA concerns about this kind of the sphere of influence uh, and also uh, do things that wouldn't raise their threat so annexing a country obviously would be a significant um, event that would raise their threat notice here too you have description of kind of who they have as puppets uh, non-aggression pact pretty self-explanatory uh, ask for transit rights that's just military transit rights uh, aligned to faction. So if you are uh, a one of these, say say you're the Germans, or you are an ally of the Axis, or or any of these countries here, what you can do is you can influence countries that aren't a part of these, and try and get them to align to the Axis, or align to the Allies, or align, align to the Common Turn. I like to do that with Burma. So uh, I think it's Burma, uh, sorry, Siam. Um, if I ever join the Axis, then I'll start influencing Siam because they're a nice little launch pad into uh, France, uh, into the French territories and the English territories down in, say, t Tibet, and so, or uh, Tibet, Thailand and so forth. Um, so just to show you here, this is Siam right here, these guys. Um, so one of the things I'd like to do is try and influence them, get them to become essentially uh, fascist in their political leanings, and then hopefully get them to join the alliance or give me transit rights or something of that sort. Alright, so I've shown you this tab here. Let's go back to all all here, this here. Uh, you then can look at it um, by kind of dividing it up depending on who you want to look at. And then these are the individual tabs that you would do with that particular country, in this case Siam. Buy production license. Uh, this is a really important tab, kind of say mid-game. Um, imagine if you're the Brits and you focused a lot of your technology into naval and into air, but you're seriously lacking in infantry and tanks. Well one of the things you might do is buy from the Americans a license to build the American Sherman tank for example. Um, so it's a really good way to basically if you've got the money uh, buy another country's essentially uh, their product and incorporate it into your military. Allow Dad is just that. You ask a country, hey can, can I basically buy stuff from you without paying you? Um, you a lot of times you're only going to do that with your allies. And then lend lease is uh, essentially this right here. So this is basically saying, hey, Italy, they want to do lend lease. I give them 10 of my IC, so I have 28. They get an additional 10, um, and then they use that to to build stuff, right? So that's really the diplomacy tab in a nutshell. Um, here, these are just events that that trigger. Black Ice uses these uh, every year. You have different options that you can trigger. For example, here with the espionage focus, um, and this is going to take us into our politics tab. Notice here, if um, political intel and then ruling party support. So ruling party support, 2%. If we go to the politics tab, notice here that I've essentially got four to five different factions that all are almost equally influential currently, with the socialist conservative being a little bit stronger than the paternal autocrat, which is what we are right here. So you say, how do we make the paternal autocrats the overwhelming influence in the government? How do we do that? Well, one of the ways is what I just did, that uh, political influence or a ruling party influence of 2%. So that'll increase. So every year, 
will have a 2% bonus to their influence as paternal autocrats in the in the country. Also, you'll get random events popping up that, that will influence kind of which way your government's going to go. And so you can make it more social conservative, you can make it more paternal autocrat, so on and so forth. Uh, notice that if, say, we just kept pushing with the social conservative outlook, we'd start kind of drifting probably more towards a democratic political government, which would then have other consequences such as <clears throat> the ability to declare war, um, maybe more expensive as far as our consumer goods, I mean, we have to, to basically use more IC to feed our people and keep them happy and so forth. Uh, but then also it would allow us to kind of align with the U.S. and, and make them happy or whatever. So anyways, another uh, so one of the downsides to having a split government is it drastically affects the efficiency their government operates. So this is actually causing a negative, having all these splits. It's causing an overall negative to the efficiency of our, of our empire. Uh, so you definitely want to try and narrow that down and try and get at least one party to be in control, uh, primarily in control. Um, notice here, so we're paternal autocrat, that means we get two qualifying cabinet positions. The fascists have one cabinet uh, position. So what will happen is once the game starts, gets rolling, notice here we have two fascists. We've got uh, this guy who's a fascist. We've got uh, Yamamoto who's a fascist. Um, so that means when you replace, essentially you can only have one fascist on the cabinet at a time. And so if there's a lot of fascists who are really good, you can only get one of them on your cabinet at a time. And so again, it affects these overall bonuses. One of the things you can do, so like foreign minister, again, we're talking about really ruling party support, right? So he is, is he a fascist? I can't tell. I think he's in charge right now. He looks like a fascist. It's hard to tell. I think he's a fascist. So he gives you ruling party support. So again, that's that bonus, right? So the, anyway, why did I say fascist? Paternal autocrat. Paternal autocrats now have, as you can tell, a 3% bonus in ruling party support between him. But then we lose two from this J-hole, who is a uh, hurting us, typical uh, emperor. Um, and then, but so you just go along and you replace various members with different bonuses that you want to basically impose on your empire. So this guy right now is giving us a plus 75 to money because he's a laissez-faire. But then he's reducing our overall resource production up here by 5%. And usually you're going to find that most uh, most leaders are going to give you some sort of minus in addition to positives. Um, it's going to be a little rare that you're going to find someone who gives you all green like this guy right here. Uh, but again, he's a social conservative. We want to try and get those guys out. And so he may not be, he may become uh, no longer even an option for us later in the game if we go uh, heavily fascist or heavily uh, paternal autocrat. Notice here this leadership bonus is plus 5%. Uh, keep that in mind, and because that's going to be discussed in the technology tab. But just realize that when you see leadership modifier, that usually is directly related to your technology tab. All right, and then notice here with like naval and air force and all stuff, all these different options here. Create puppet. So we currently control Korea and uh, so basically we control Korea, which obvious for those who aren't geographic savvy, that's right here. This was not originally Japanese land, and so therefore we have the option to create a puppet if we want. Uh, really, the only advantage to that is one: you, the less people you have to worry, less territory you have to worry about revolting against you, uh, and it also just world uh, the world looks favorably on a puppet and makes them uh, lowers their threat towards you, and um, can affect their neutrality towards you as well. Uh, right now, like with the with the way that the game's set up. You don't have to, Korea pretty much acts as if it's your own empire and so does Manchuko, so you don't have to worry about that right now. And then finally, these options here. These again can affect how you decide how you want to balance stuff out. Currently we're in li limited restrictions. As you evolve through the game, sometimes these options will open up. And so notice here, if we went down to legalistic restrictions, Instead of getting a plus two to IC and all these bonuses, we get a consumer goods during wartime, minus 2%. So when you declare war, a lot of times some of these things are going to open up for you. And sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. It really just depends on what you're gearing towards trying to achieve. So for, for example, with the conscription, conscription laws, we're currently on volunteer army. But what you can do is as you uh, go to war or get kind of into a war footing, these options open up for you. And sometimes it's good to go all the way down to something like this where it's service by requirement. 
other times because of the cost that it might, it might impose on you for doing it. Maybe it's better to go three-year draft or two-year draft or whatever. Um, but all these options here affect your overall empire. So notice here that you have three options here. Currently we are on, what, massive education? Yeah, currently we're down here. But notice it's minus 15 money. And so maybe if we want to um, increase our bottom line up here, we want to make it minus 10. And uh, in return, you know, we're saving 5% money, but we're also getting 4% less leadership modifier and 10% uh, less in officer recruitment. So that's that. All right, mobilize. This is something you want to trigger a good, uh, it, you know, if, if you're the one that's going to be in deciding when you're going to war deck. So say if you're going to war deck in uh, July, then probably no later than June, you want to trigger mobilization. What that's going to do is all your units that are in reserve status are going to get called up into active duty status and start building up their organization and their, their manpower. So you click that and it'll start doing it. It's very expensive. That's why I say probably a month to two months and probably no sooner than that. I think if you do it a month, uh, you should be okay to be extra safe. You could extra safe. You could do it two months. Um, but what that'll do is it hit the mobilization tab. All your reserves are going to active duty status, and then this recruitment reinforcement bar is going to go way up. You're going to have to put a whole bunch of IC into reinforcement to get your guys reinforced in time for for battle. All right. So we went through the diplomacy tab, went through the politics tab, intel tab, really fast. So again, all the countries here, right? So let's say, let's go People's Republic of China. Let's find them. Republic of China. Currently we have two spies there. We don't have a spy priority yet though. So let's say we want to make them the most prioritized out of all the other countries. What that does is, okay, we want to put spies into China. We want this to be a high priority. And then what you can do is you can basically dictate how many spies you're going to have in their country at any given time by basically selecting how many different things you want to do here. So if we were about to war deck them, we'd want to go with disrupt, disrupt national unity. Again, as we were talking about before, right? Currently their, their national unity is 97.8. But say we want to go in, take all those VP spots that we were talking about before, and then uh, as we do that, their national unity is going to decrease. Along with that, with them constantly losing battles, and then me also having spies in there to disrupt their national unity, hopefully it'll make them surrender sooner rather than later. All right. But support our party. So that's one way. So, you know, I was talking with the Cy uh, with Siam, trying to make them align with my uh, my government. One way I could do that is send spies into Siam and do support our party uh, or support our ru ruling party, uh, which would basically make them um, improve the organization of uh, their paternal autocrats or fascists, whichever way.